Hello to viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Future Friday, we're gonna talk about MagRail from Nevermore. So let's dive deep into it. So what exactly is the idea here? So idea is that if you can add maglev system to existing railway, it will be magical. Because right now the reason maglev never catches on actually is simply because you have to build a completely new track for it, dedicated for it. That is idiotically expensive. That even China only builds a small tracks for it. So you have to understand. And Japan has been trying to do this and they are burning money like there is no tomorrow. It is costing in billions of dollars and like up to 70 or 80 million dollar per kilometer. So it's bonkersly high. So what if you can put the same technology, maglev technology on existing rail? Now, what would be the benefit of it? Benefit would be turbocharging the existing network. Uh, so as in speed, so you can reduce travel time. Is there a benefit to that? Absolutely. The more you reduce the traveling time, the more people switch from either driving to their destination or flying to their destination. And a maglev is better in both of them comparatively. Even the high energy drop, because you are moving such a large volume of people, it's fundamentally better. So if you can stop, let's say hundreds of people from flying, that has tangible good. Uh, in terms of your carbon footprint. So it is a desirable thing. And we no longer need to build new links from the start. And this part, uh, way too many people overlook, is not the technology that's the expensive, it's the tracks. And not even the track itself is the land acquisition that is bonkersly difficult to do. And uh, the primary reason why Japanese maglev system is so expensive is like, because you are increasing the speed, you have to keep it very straight. You cannot just have turns. So turn radius has to be very gentle. Consequence, uh, majority of the things either you can do in tunnel or you have to bore through mountains. Both of them can be done, but you do not talk about money at that point in time. And there is a consequence. If you go through way too much tunnel, uh, you increase your drag because again, in open air, uh, your uh, train is moving the air out of the way without any issue. In tunnel, it's almost acting like an air compressor. So it does have some penalty. So that's why this idea is very attractive to many companies, be it IronLev or be this Magler. So how the heck this will work? Well, uh, the reality is they are using something known and proven that is linear motor for the central track, as in like you're gonna have two rails and then you're gonna have central linear rail. Now, thankfully, this technology is known, ancient. It's been used in Vancouver Skytrain, the most popular one, that's what I'm talking about. So it does have some benefits. For example, as you can see, like this track has way too much up and down. Yeah, because of the linear uh, nature of it and the fact that it's directly magnetically coupling uh, basically the rotor to the stator, which is actually static, uh, the benefit is there is no slippage. You can climb very steep with this. Compared to normal trains, this puppy is like, I got this. That's why Vancouver Sky is like going ding chick It can be done quite easily. So that they are using as the core fundamental. On top of that, how the heck they're gonna get pushed off? Well, to push off on the sides, they have permanent magnet solutions and this puppy will utilize eddy current to push it off. So basically, as you keep increasing your speed, it will first start to become lighter and lighter. And then once you cross around roughly 80 to 100 kilometer per hour, then this puppy will like, ta-da, it will start to fly. Now, now, if you are like, hey, that sounds exactly like Japanese system. Yes, it is. In Japanese system, they have wheels for up to 100 and 150 km per hour. And once they cross that threshold, we, uh, basically the wheels retract. Benefit of that is now you have smooth aerodynamics. So here you do not have retraction, uh, but uh, it's a two-way swap. Be benefit is like if any failure happens, you uh, ride back onto the rails. And because of the uh, distance is very small, so it's not going to be very brutal. So you can see like it's flying very close to it. And it has st active stabilization for guide rails. You can use passive systems for uh, eddy currents and all that jazz. It does work. Uh, Iron Lev is trying that. But if you have paid attention to Iron Lev video, you must have heard I talked about they had roller bearings to grab the rail. Otherwise, it will uh, hit one of the sides. Same here will happen. So how they are solving it? First, they have the central uh, axle that is giving them the most oomph. Second, they have the two linear guideways. These guideways are the one that is like allowing them uh, traction and they have electromagnetic systems on them. Like permanent magnet is the bulk carrier. Electromagnet is just there as like, you know, tuning it. Basically, they are like balancing out, cancelling oscillations and things of that nature. It's, so it's a 80% passive, 20% active. First, you have to be active for stabilization. Anybody working with permanent bearings can tell you, it's like you have to have some active system. Uh, so same thing here. All the components of this is known, tested, and again, they built a actual rail that is like actual rail track with actual uh, railway degree, uh, railway level specification and they tested it and it does work. So science and technology is sorted. 
so they built a demo track now this was the first uh, limiting uh, tracks on existing rail again i do not know why they are calling this but uh, the best I can figure out is the reason why they are calling they are the first not iron lev is that iron lev touches the rollers there is like physical contact between the rails here there is no physical contact it's physically floating there is nothing nothing zero zero uh, and uh, that is their first product that they are offering they also have a first autonomous freight wagons uh, this puppy basically now uh, the idea with this is this is not for uh, railway systems but this is more for shipyards basically because of the ludicrously huge container ships that we are building uh, they take a long time to debark so to say dump all their cargo and consequence of that is trucks are no longer efficient enough so we have to utilize trains now problem with trains is while they are efficient and they can haul ass uh, they have issue of the fact that how the heck you separate each of them that becomes a hassle so the idea is that each they're gonna buy the carriage directly from the market and they're gonna uh, install a package then they're gonna install the package on the rail and then they're gonna install that and i do not think this one is levitating so what they are selling is like a package that allows you to linearly move and uh, does not require to change the bogies and all that jazz and it can autonomously go so you can have uh, basically rail yard putting all the sh from ship container to train and once the train clears that area then it will can easily switch on its own to different 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 locations so dumping would be much easier so they have also tested this one this one is that so as you can see it's like literally the same size as a uh, container ship okay a bit smaller so you can see so they built this this was again tested in september 2023 i do not know the exact date because the best i can tell you is the date of video upload i do not know is exactly the same day or a few days after that but uh, roughly that time and uh, the what does it prove they built a proof what does it prove so proving part is that it can utilize uh, basically old railway even if you take a rail track you're not just paying for the metals that are there you're not just paying for the slippers you are paying bonkers amount of money for that physical location and then compacting of the soil and then doing two three things on it depending on the geology of that location and then putting gravel on top then you're putting the slippers and all that here you have to eat all the sleepers out of it sleeper rail basically you have to do fresh rail laying off tracks uh, that is meant for this so it will have uh, three extra component left and right uh, guide vein and uh, central reactor for uh, basically your in linear induction motor so you have to do new track but here's the it will not require you to redo the grading it will not require to drill any pillars nothing it's just like it's basically like if a track is old enough while maintenance while we do replace it you can just add a new one it can be done and it will still support the old system without any issue as in uh, if you want you can have a scenario where the railway track is using normal locomotives for pulling freight and when a passenger is there passenger is flying based on magnetic system on the same track that's the unique selling point of what they are offering here and uh, it should also work with existing track switches and if you are familiar with uh, how uh, third rail works okay third rail also has the switch and it does not disconnect basically you have multiple shoes only some disconnect majority remains connected your train can easily cross over same applies here so yes on the switches itself there will be disconnect of uh, basically this pusher and all that but it should not have any issue it is it is a, ma a manageable solution and uh, what they are very excited about is that this proved is that they can do what call overnight retrofitting european union does not have 24 into 7 railway system like heavy use railway system as india does so majority of the railway tracks are like very low use at night so what they are planning and proposing is that at night you're going to use your railway system as it is at night you're going to swap few sections of it next night you're going to few swap few sections nothing no subscription uh, basically no uh, damage to schedules no, nothing nothing will change passengers will not even know and one day randomly a new train come come in and it's like now float to your destination so that's what they are offering and this track proves in principle that it can be done so this is what they achieved and they got a lot of grants after showing the actual demo so what about the company now, company uh, i lost interest the moment i figured out that they were hyper poland and if you have watched my channel you know my feelings on hyperloop Hululu. so hyperloop they tried in april 2017 that's how this company started yeah all of this has disappeared and uh, they renamed and they were very clever with it so what they did is like yeah we are not just focusing on hyperloop we are focusing on high speed transportation so they are like hey first we're gonna modify the existing system then we're gonna upgrade to maglev system then we're gonna put maglev in a vacuum tube basically hyperloop so they have created a three-stage plan and this is uh, far more uh, digestible so i think it's a very clever pun and uh, they renamed theirs themselves in uh, 2020 yeah nobody wants that word hyperloop anymore enough billionaires have burnt that is like yeah now it's time to shh, shh. so Oh, and this track, yeah, it's been removed. Uh, they have been repaved with normal railway. Yeah, look into the Google map. It's awesome. 
So that happened and they do have some patents for high speed railway and all that. And in year 2022, they built the test track, the track where they were showing all the testings uh, for passive magnetic levitation. Uh, electromagnetic levitation is awesome. Uh, passive magnetic levitation technically is, is the same thing that is being done by uh, basically Japanese maglev. But you do have to understand one thing. It requires superconductors. And to keep superconductor superconducting, it's like first uh, they create a loop and then they dunk that puppy into liquid helium and then they dunk the whole carriage into liquid nitrogen and then they run uh, compressors to keep it cool. Yeah, it's very difficult. And then they short current into it. Once the magnetic energy gets inside, it gets trapped. So it becomes a permanent magnet. So in principle, it's the same thing. But the flux, the oomph, the Tesla of that puppy is huge. Uh, you cannot achieve that kind of Tesla from neodymium magnet. They can utilize normal neodymium magnets and electromagnets to guide uh, that puppy to stabilize, basically, stabilizing vectors. So passive magnetic so you will not require uh, liquid helium cooled by liquid nitrogen, then cooled by pulse cryocoolers and all that jazz. Simple things, elegant things does work. And uh, they are getting funding via equity and non-derivative EU grants. So basically EU has given a lot of grant. Uh, you can watch this channel, they are talking directly about this. And this is where I learned that that's what their plan is. It's like we can swap everything and customer will never face any issue where it's like, oh, trains is cancelled because you are changing the track. That should not happen, ideally. So this is the company side of things. So what can we expect in the future? Well, here's the, uh, they can support old rail, that's awesome, meaning you can, again, you can have a high speed passenger and you can have slow speed bulk cargo on the same track, that's awesome, that is flat out, desirable and cheap, because here's the, even if you have to replace the rail system, the ground and the, all the structure that you had to build to make sure that is stable, yeah, that's expensive too, so this is good. Uh, but here's the deal. How the heck they're gonna transmit power wirelessly? Because again, you may be like, what if I take it from the top? Yeah, you can do that, but you will lose all the benefit. And uh, same thing is uh, true with the Japanese maglev system. They have to use inductively transmitting the energy. Consequence of that puppy is that uh, track cost goes stupid, as in upwards of $77 million per kilometer. Again, it's very expensive. So that's a very big unknown so you can have onboard power plant or you can have uh, batteries i do not know how they will solve it and they have not talked too much about it or maybe i have missed it but if you know please write it down below and they have autonomous cargo rail it does not make sense to me simply because why would anybody do that the reason why we do railway in like shipyards is because it's simple you just uh, one locomotive pulls it in done you load it up once it's fully loaded eat there we have train yards we have and be mindful you have to have someone or automated system that is switching so it can be done anyway so it does not make sense to me and again same issue happens there again it's not even levitating and how the heck you are powering so much you're not talking about a large train there you're talking about each uh, carriage itself <coughs> So how you are powering it? Can you do inductive charging there? Of course you can do it, but it's going to be stupidly expensive. And you are talking about an industry that is trying to cut costs. So I do not see a reason there. So again, that's up to me. And the biggest issue is how the heck you are transmitting power wirelessly. It can be done. It just can't be done cheaply. So you can see the three things they need, uh, linear motor and levitation system on the sides, left and right. Now science is solid, let this be very clear. They're, they are comparing this conventional rail, then they're gonna go to mag rail, and then they're gonna finally go to hyperloop. So science is sorted, except the hyperloop part, but science is sorted here. And um, here's the The missing part is that at that speed, basically at 300 kilometers per hour, uh, rolling resistance does not matter that much. That's why we have trains that are running at that speed. Air drag matters more compared to your rolling resistance. Unless you are driving ludicrously fast, 500 to 600 km per hour, you will not reach a point where rolling resistance is a very big issue. Air resistance is a bigger issue. That's why people fell for hyperloop. So this idea of like, I'm going to reduce your rolling resistance and I'm going to add some amount of magnetic drag from eddy current system. Okay, some would be there. So uh, how much you are saving? And you are, uh, the worst thing you are doing is increasing the capex and maintenance cost. Uh, basically, you instead of just having railway tracks, now you have exponentially more stuff. And if it's a wireless transmitter also, even more stuff. So fundamentally, it's a very difficult thing. And another thing is like they are saying that same track can have high speed. Yeah, that's an oxymoron that does not work that way. If you have a track that was designed and engineered for let's say 330 kilometer, meaning when people were laying out their tracks, they designed the curves to keep under the G loading. Can you turn faster than that? Absolutely. It's just that people won't be comfortable. So if you had the same track that you're like, okay, I'm going to put maglev system and here's the deal. The maglev system is robust enough. It can handle the G loads and you turn at that high speed, people inside would be like yeeted out of their seats. So that is why, again, this is another reason why Japanese system is so expensive is like they could not turn it. They could not, oh, there's a mountain, I'm going to Tokyo drift it. They cannot Tokyo drift. They're like, I have to drill through it and now pay a boatload of money for this. So 
same thing if the track speed is 300 km per hour you are still 300 km per hour maybe a little bit more if uh, engineers were a bit generous maybe, maybe but uh, nothing more than that do not expect like oh the track was built uh, in the let's say 1970s for 150 km per hour i'm gonna put a maglev and then i'm gonna fly at 200 yeah that's not happening that's not happening because again it will be very brutal on the people inside it can be done again fighter just do that but they require g suit and it's not a comfortable experience so that's the issue you cannot expect this increase uh, speed to increase exponentially and you are saving only a little bit of power that's the issue rolling resistance is a thing that's absolutely true but it does not become your bottleneck unless you are top tapping very high speed 400 plus if you're 300 that's why we have high speed range that is working at that speed it does not matter that much. Yeah, it's an issue. But aerodynamics is like, bro, I am the bigger issue. And that's why people were so excited about Hyperloop. If you can remove the air as a component, your train is like, bro, I got this. I'm flying. But we can't do that. So I do not see the economics. It almost feels like uh, how uh, Concord felt like, where it's like engineering, awesome. For science, awesome. Economics, no. So it crashed. Same thing here. It's like science, awesome. The fact that you can have the two things on the same thing, that's awesome. It's just that, what are you gaining at the other end? Like, and again, I have not seen how the heck you can have power wirelessly. It can be done, let that be very clear, it can be done. It just can't be done cheaply. So, and be mindful, we are talking about public transport. It has to have a good way of uh, basically not becoming a dead trap like a nuclear power plants. So, there is some issues here. So, let's see what happens in the future. I do expect to see some prototypes, but I do not see too much in the future. So this was my presentation on maglev system uh, that is going to reuse our older tracks. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst your friends. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show my stress point with. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free. And as always, thanks for watching.